Welcome back to the leading edge of integrative mental health. I'm your host, Lisa Dale Miller. Please review and subscribe to the Groundless Ground podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Radio.com, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and of course, find out more at GroundlessGround.com. I'm ready to go. How about you? Get ready for a microbiome geek fest with Cornell Professor Emeritus Rodney Dietert as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of his pioneering book, The Human Superorganism. Rodney shares the fascinating history of microbiome research and recounts his own life-changing career-shifting revelations about the role of microbiome therapies in reversing the modern epidemic of non-communicable chronic diseases and immune system dysfunction. We discuss the difference between viruses and bacteria, and because our dialogue took place in June 2021, he offered surprising views about COVID-19, vaccines, and mask wearing. We also cover the latest research on microbiome testing, probiotics, prebiotics, rebiosis, and fecal transplant interventions for physical and mental health disorders. Strap in your seatbelt. This is quite the episode. If you can hang in there with all the science, you'll enjoy it tremendously. Rodney Dietert, you are the renowned author of over 70 peer-reviewed papers and, of course, the pioneering book on the microbiome titled The Human Superorganism, which I have to say is one of my favorite books of all time. You've spent your career researching the role of the microbiome in our modern epidemic of non-communicable chronic diseases and immune system dysfunction. And yet there's so much confusion about the microbiome and the use of probiotics, prebiotics to heal it. First, I wanted to add just one thing. I actually spent most of my career working on the developing immune system, so protecting the immune system of children. And the reason I came to work on the microbiome was it's not because I was trained in that area, but I had a problem trying to write a paper and was very frustrated about it and woke up in the middle of the night from a dream with an idea that involved the microbiome and everything flowed from there. So it was just like one opportunity after the next, after the next. Basically, rather than trusting in decades of what I had been doing, I followed the dream information and that proved to be more useful really in terms of what I can contribute. It's been a shorter time period since 2012 is actually where I focused on the microbiome. Thank goodness. <laughs> but wouldn't you say that was really the inception of medicine and science focusing on the microbiome at all? Yes, a little bit. There certainly were people doing it a little bit earlier. The irony is, if you don't mind me sharing a little immunology history, Please. there's a famous person working on my favorite cell in the immune system, macrophages. And macrophages used to be thought of as just the garbage collector. All they did was go around and pick up dead red blood cells and things like that. Well, it turns out that I taught macrophage biology at Cornell for a while. Macrophages are so much more. It turns out that Metchenkoff got the Nobel Prize because he discovered what the function of macrophages was. He discovered how phagocytosis worked and was working with phagocytosis, macrophages, phagocytosing bacteria. He didn't hate bacteria. In fact, he had personally learned of villages where people lived incredibly long lives over in the Caucasus. And he went over and poked around and found out that is contributing to this. And they were drinking fermented cultures that contain Bulgaris, the species name of the bacteria. But it was kind of parallel to things like Lactobacillus acidophilus. And he started consuming it. And he was convinced that was really the key to a good gut, better health. People actually started following it, but unfortunately, of course, this was later in life when he did this, he wound up dying of a heart attack. And everybody said, oh, don't drink that. The guy died. <laughs> you know? And if only, if only that had not happened, he was you know, Nobel Prize winner in medicine for discovering key things about the immune system. He was convinced this was the way to go. So this was like 1905, 1910. We would have been doing probiotics seriously so much earlier. And then we had Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin and led to the antibiotic revolution, which was key in saving lives in World War II. But Fleming didn't hate bacteria either. Fleming did microbial art. You may not be aware of that. 
he actually painted some of my talks I show Fleming Barton work and he painted uh, a, a mother with a, a baby bottle and probably had formula unfortunately instead of breast milk in those days he he presented the queen took a tour of their new hospital with a microbial representation of the British flag and she was rather disparaging so oh, what good is that He'd work with bacteria that have colors, and he did a lot of artwork, so he loved microbes. But uh, contrary to popular belief, none of those guys thought that the best microbe is a dead microbe. They had a much better perspective than we have had for the rest of the 20th century and the start of this century. There were people that knew way back over 100 years ago, and then some bacteriologists in the 60s we should have listened to that had a pretty good idea, and some gut people we should have listened to. But you're right, it was early 2005 where things started to get real serious. It was sort of the underwhelming result of the human genome and the fact that there weren't enough genes there to explain much of what was going on. And we weren't going to cure all the diseases with the chromosomal genes. People started to say, uh, I wonder if there's some other genes. And the answer was, yeah, over 99% of your genes are microbial. So if you actually are a physician or a geneticist and you actually want to do something useful for humans, uh, maybe you ought to do what I call microbiome first medicine and that start with the majority <laughs> i think this is so fascinating even in the first five minutes of our conversation you have put your finger on what i perceive is the biggest problem so everybody knows about crispr everybody knows about gene technology but very few people really know human genes, very small number. Right. All of our bodily systems have their own microbiomes. We exist because of them, because I spend my days working with human psyches and nervous system dysregulation. This is the kind of thing I have to tell people over and over again. You think you are just a thought. That's what you think you are, is just a mind. But mm -hmm. there's this entire organism that is running the show under the hood you know nothing about, but you're having a huge impact on destroying the organism with the way you comport yourself and what you eat and how you live. You expressed it so beautifully. I mean, it, it's thousands of species that we have. I mean, even in the gut, we have very close relatives to species that live in the most extreme places on Earth. I mean, the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the Dead Sea, 300 feet under Antarctic glaciers, on the International Space Station, they're growing. They're called extremophile bacteria and archaea. And we have some of those in our gut as well. And they communicate through electrochemistry. And some of them are, have magnetic field responses. They're on what is really the outside of us in terms of the majority of the microbes in us, not all. Breast tissue has its own microbiome, and, and that's different from breast milk microbiome. They are a connection to the environment, to what's outside us. And we kind of see them through the microbial lens, so to speak, and they're a gatekeeper or filter. So you're right. It's really uh, uh, letting people know what they really are. And what they really are is a representation of life on Earth. Don't let anybody tell you that we don't deserve to belong here and that we're not really creatures that help with Earth. Microbes are the most predominant life form on Earth, period. That is what Earth's life is in majority, and we carry a huge amount. And we're like Johnny Appleseed because we're mobile all over the world. We travel and we spread. So you hear from the bureaucrats that what we spread are infections. But in reality, majority of the microbes we have are needed for life. They're friendly and they're important in, in ecological niches. And we spread those uh, as well. That's probably useful for the microbes. The more you dive into what the microbes do for us, in us, with us, you start to question who's in control. Or that at least if you could manage your microbes, they can make changing your diet very difficult. If you've grown up a garden of pizza-loving microbes and you want to eat kale, good luck with that. Because they can actually make it painful, painful in your neurological system working with your microbes and being the master gardener of something that is profoundly important for not just your health, but I will contend it's actually important for your being connected. Microbes are the Earth's internet. There's some evidence I can talk about that establishes getting information at a distance and how using yeah. microbes does that. 
when we get great ideas, like when I got my dream in the middle of the night, it could have been embodied cognition. It could have been, uh, well, that little toe down there had what I needed to know, but it also could have been through the microbiome. If I do another book, that's what it's going to be about. We are not using the capabilities that we have at hand for us. Part of it is our education is not made that kind of information available. So I, I think we need to realize that these are not only our friends and our helpers in host defense against dangerous factors in the environment, but they actually enable us to be more than we probably realized we could be. Interesting. It might be helpful for you to describe the difference between bacteria and viruses. These days, people have had very personal experience. A particular virus has radically changed their world for the last year. So people are not thinking very kindly about viruses. People often think of bacteria as something that's going to make us sick. Bacteria are, are much larger. They are more self-sustaining, I guess you'd say. Viruses need help. They need a host, you know, like humans in some cases. But what you need to realize is we have a viral. So we carry viruses around with us all the time. Don't let somebody sell you on thinking that you're sick because one virus got into you and otherwise you were pristine clean. Pristine clean is going to be not survivability if you start killing all your microbes. They make things like vitamin K that we can't produce. Now you can get it supplementing. That's the reality. Our ancestors had to have those microbes or they die. Pure and simple. We don't live without them. The virome is part of it, but think about other viruses. So there, there are viruses that can infect human cells. And by the way, they come in at what we call portals of entry. So if you think about how pathogens that aren't already here get in, we breathe them in. That's where the microbiome is, the airways. Or we ingest them. That's where the microbiome is. Or they're on our skin and we get a break in the skin or the your genital tract. All what the microbiologists call portals of entry for infectious agents are where the, our microbiome exists. And it turns out there's this incredible defense mechanism called colonization resistance. So if you actually have ecologically managed your microbiome in a robust way, you don't even need to worry about your immune system. You're helping the immune system only have to be triggered in extreme circumstances because you're using microbes against microbes. Have you heard any bureaucrats in the pandemic, any of the scientists that are in the uh, governmental type systems, have you heard any of them talk about, let's use microbes against microbes? Yeah. They do say there'll be more pandemics. You no, know, we actually want people with a good immune system and all the things that support balanced immune response. And we're doing just the opposite, in my opinion, with the restrictions that uh, we've been asked to follow. If you get me started, this is not public health and it's not what we've practiced in the past as just so I feel clear, are mm -hmm. you suggesting herd immunity would have been the preferable recipe? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, and, and one of the premier lectures at, in teacher, teacher in immunology who used to work for the CDC and was my colleague at Cornell, I heard his herd immunity lectures, basic immunology course at Cornell. Uh, mm -hmm. I was actually originally hired in the 70s not to work on children's immune systems, but chickens to have natural immunity. And what they wanted was natural immunity. And then worry about the rest that you can't cover. You want the animals as healthy as possible. We need the humans as healthy as possible. So the idea of selling very expensive drugs just because you can make a vaccine does not necessarily mean that everybody in the world should have a vaccine. Let me argue vaccines have their place, but it does not mean that just because the technology exists, that that's a wonderful public health option to pursue, in my opinion. I'm not anti-vax, but I am anti-indiscriminate use of vaccines. So here's the key. If you go to a pediatrician and you ask them, what is the optimum time to actually immunologically to vaccinate my child? You won't get an answer. Because? Because they don't know. There's an interesting thing. So we're actually vaccinated to get the immune system to do something. Children have come out of the uterus has only half of the child's immune system has been permitted to develop normally. And the mother's immune system is modified during pregnancy so that she doesn't reject the fetus because of father's proteins. He just has father's genes. And just as a safeguard, can't have that part of the immune response robust during pregnancy. If you want evidence of it, it's because some women experience more severe allergies of particular types during pregnancy, and they go away after childbirth. And if they have lupus, they're likely to have more severe symptoms because it's that segment of the immune system that's permitted to come to the forefront 
in the baby and in the mom that actually would drive lupus. You see some autoimmune conditions get worse symptomology, and you see some allergies get worse, and then they go away. And that's showing you the mom's immune system is deliberately skewed so she can carry the full term. But the baby's immune system, only half of it can develop. In the 70s, when I was at Cornell teaching immunology, they, one of the dogmas that I claim, say has to go away now is that the baby's immune system is good to go at birth. And that's based on the fact that they would count the cells and they would say, well, we can count them. They seem to all be here. It looks great. But they weren't doing function and they didn't know what to measure for good biomarkers for all the functions. They didn't even know all the immune cells they were going to discover, you know, since the 1970s to now and all the cytokines immune hormones. So it turns out that again, the baby has to catch up. The baby is completely imbalanced at birth. It is designed so that there will be gut inflammation unless you get the right microbes in place and unless they're digesting human milk oligosaccharides. Yeah. Allergy and autoimmunity are preferred types of responses in the newborn unless and until the microbiome helps that other segment of the immune system develop. So the baby actually needs to be exposed to microbes in a controlled, managed way, but it is absolutely necessary. Or that baby is on a path as the cohort of those individuals are on a path for higher prevalence of allergic, autoimmune, and inflammatory disease. Isn't it also true that because cesarean section became so popular, it was not known that coming through the birth canal and into the uterus deposited a whole slew of microbiome creatures on the baby, and that was protective for the baby. Yes, absolutely correct. That is probably the first thing that we need to look at in terms of lifelong health is the baby being seeded by mom as would occur in natural childbirth. There are medically necessary cesareans. Yes. Elective cesarean has been rising in many, many countries. It's way above what it used to be. So there are investigators like Gloria Domingo Bellas at Rutgers who have developed a va vaginal swab uh, process. Mm -hmm. It's been refined uh, since she first developed it. And it's pretty good. It's, if it's not 100%, it's close. And it's much better than the baby not getting seeded. The way we used to do safety testing where the microbiome was never included in anything for drugs, chemicals, or food additives, people would look at the baby, say, wow, the baby looks really clean. Wow, six months later, baby's doing great. I guess this is not contributing to any risk or any problem. Cesarean's wonderful. But no, because then if you start to chart the emergence of childhood chronic diseases that then themselves will have comorbidities. Uh, I mean, obesity has 32 comorbidities, childhood asthma, double digit comorbidities. The problem is you can't go down that path. You can't miss developmental steps where the immune system needs to change. Neurosystem and the brain development needs to happen. Neurobehavior is dramatically influenced by microbiome. That's a critical period. We're doing a few things is bigger bang for the buck. It's harder to change. At my age, you can, but it's harder to correct problems with the immune system through the microbiome. Here now, vaginal delivery, that seeding event where mom's contributing more than just 50% of the genetics to that baby is critical. And I've told OBGYNs, you know, you actually impact two generational health. You didn't know you used to do this. Don't wait to correct mom's microbiome. If she's obese, if she's carrying chronic diseases, and the microbiome is in what we call dysbiosis, it's way out of balance, it's restricted, doesn't have the diversity, you're preparing the bolus that will be seeded into the newborn, into the baby at birth. Get it right. You can affect that baby like nobody else. And then same thing for pediatricians to understand what's got to be there and what it needs to be fed. One of the things that gets seeded early on is Bifidobacterium infantis. And that's the important thing to remember is infantis. That is one of the predominant early bacteria in the gut. That and related ones to that are the best metabolizers of human milk oligosaccharide. Really, breast milk is the food for infantis to begin with. That's what it's there for. Human mammalian cells cannot digest those complex sugars in breast milk, only the bacteria. And way back about 2014 or 15, I was lecturing at a, a pharmaceutical conference in New Jersey, and somebody, not while I was on the stage, but later, asked me, said, say, is this microbiome thing a fad? And I said, only if you think that breast milk is a fad, because the fact that over millennia, those sugars were there is the, the, one of the predominant components of breast milk. And the baby, as a human, can't even use it, unusable. That's how important the microbes are. Breast milk's yeah. designed, first and foremost, for the microbes.
Infanus generates this massive, wonderful metabolite pool, and that's what helps shift the immune system and dampen inherent inflammation that otherwise will get started in that baby. So, you know, things like colitis that are going to emerge and start you down a path of uncontrolled, misregulated inflammation. What happens is there's a march of microbe diversity that happens after that, and some of the ones that regulate the mucin layer in the gut then will come into play a little bit later on. And breast milk changes in its profile because their microbes also coming through breast milk, and infantis is, is one of the first ones. Colostrum is different than breast milk. Breast milk over time, if there is prolonged nursing, it changes composition to match the microbes that it's trying to cultivate. Is there research that shows the best length of time for breastfeeding in order to seed probably, I'd say, the richest microbial no. environment? To my knowledge, there's no definitive benchmark, uh, but certainly going at least six months, you know, somewhere between the six months to a year period is probably where the, the sweet spot is on that. There's differences of opinion. It kind of depends on what you measure, uh, you know, to determine where the, the best duration is. When you start to mix in foods and how much and what kinds, there's, again, a lot of discussion still about that. Now, if people are unable to breastfeed, then there are milk banks. The problem at the moment is that, that there's a pasteurization. And so you don't get the microbes. You don't get Infantis. You get the sugars, how much they're modified. You know, I mean, there's, there's some discussion on that still. So you get other components in breast milk that are not going to be killed. It's still better than in formula, but you do lose something. So we already started to make a connection between inflammation and the condition of one's microbiome. And of course, the host of complex inflammation related diseases that are feeding each other, affecting mental health as well as physical health. And you can't have those diseases if you do not have ongoing inflammation in tissues. That's the amazing thing. There, there are a couple of drugs. Charles Cernan at Harvard developed a category called Resolvins. And they're, uh, they're kind of like omega-3 fatty acids, not quite. One of the first observations they had was, wow, this seems to work against psoriasis, but then a, a gut chronic disease and also an airway chronic disease. How's that happening? And the answer is, if you actually control inflammation, those things can't persist. Now, once you've damaged the organ or the tissue, you've lost functionality, that doesn't really come back. And you need inflammation. It's, it's actually a defense mechanism, but it needs to be the right kind in the right place, and it needs to shut off when you don't need it anymore. And that's what balancing the immune system is all about. So you're absolutely right. Inflammation is the underlying driver of all of the so-called non-communicable diseases. Part of the problem, in my mind, is the fact that you have the expansion of these comorbid chronic diseases coming off of something like childhood asthma, type 1 diabetes, obesity. You continue to accumulate them as you age, and they continue to require, because of medical coding and the like, there are specialized drugs, each one of these. You accumulate polypharmacy. If it's uh, certain neurobehavioral conditions, you may need caregivers, not just medical attention. This is not sustainable healthcare. This is not, in my opinion, the healthcare we should be practicing, and it doesn't have to be that way at all. The change has to be both putting the microbiome first, but also not simply treating the presenting symptoms. A pediatrician that's treating a child's first onset of asthma and going to manage that through childhood, but then pass the child on to another physician has to realize that what they do then determines diseases that may arise in that cohort, not necessarily the individual, but the group treated by the book, you can predict exactly what's going to show up at age 30, 40, 50. And a lot of those carried throughout life, we don't cure them. So I would contend that putting the microbiome first and getting at the core problem, which again, part of that is generating inflammation when it shouldn't be happening in places it shouldn't be happening. If you don't correct that, you're just sitting by waiting for the next breakout to happen in a particular tissue and the disease that goes with it. So it's a great way to sell more drugs. It's a great way for more hospital and doctor's visits. It's not sustainable healthcare. We can't afford it either in terms of human life, quality of life, or actually healthcare costs. In general, for instance, standard treatment for childhood asthma might be an inhaler with a steroid. Mm -hmm. Steroids are given for all kinds of inflammatory disorders to quote unquote reduce inflammation. Right. And yet there seems to be some negative effect 
of reducing inflammation through that method, rather than, as you're saying, work with the microbial communities to harness the capacities that they innately have to regulate inflammation in a human body because they don't want to be around inflammation either. Exactly right. Well, what it does is it shifts the microbiome to what we call the pathobiome. So actually, they have to give up their place and allow truly dangerous bacteria to start to have a presence to grow, to reach your gut lining, to cause you to not have integrity in your gut and to cause metabolic syndrome in the end and neurological issues. What the steroids do is the person goes home and they feel good for a few weeks, but you've done nothing to correct the immune dysfunction that underlying exists. And we know we've got decades of medical records of these comorbidity produced diseases that say that this is what you get when you do this. So we need to do things differently because that is not resulting in a good life course in terms of health versus disease. You know, I just want to reiterate at this point in our conversation, so listeners really get it. I am not speaking to someone who is on the fringe. You were at Cornell, probably one of the most, I would say, conservatively minded scientific <laughs> research institutions. And yet what you're talking about, if I had a room full of physicians here, this random room full of physicians, there are probably many of them who would either disagree or refuse to sign on. And probably more of those than physicians who actually would say, yes, this is the direction we're going and all physicians, everyone in medical school needs to be trained in this. Everybody who's in any kind of psychological training program, any psychiatric resident, everybody needs to be trained in this. But that's not what's happening still. Why? Right. I spent 41 years doing immunology. I was director of the Toxicology Institute. I was one of the three people that founded the graduate program in immunology so we could train PhDs. Back, that was back in the late 80s. At Cornell, I was a senior fellow in the Center for the Environment, so looking at sustainability and the planet as well, not, not just us. But I've seen it in my own life. I had to find my own solutions because physicians have not been given the tools that they should be given. I'll be lecturing at the FDA in the fall. I've lectured there three times before. But I'm also at a point where I know, you know, I worked in safety testing development. What tools do you use to protect the immune system? And I've also seen information not be used for protecting the young or not be adapted. There's an inertia for not changing things. And I'm now emeritus, so retired from the active faculty. I've been making suggestions all along the way. I'm toward the latter stages of my life course, so it's time to make them more forcefully, more frequently, and with reaching more people, if at all possible. If I don't continue to speak out now, then when? You know, part of my goal today is, because of the nature of my podcast, well, I'm happy to talk science. One of the things that you have talked about in a very clear way is something you call an improperly trained immune system. An improperly trained immune system is guaranteed to eventually produce disease, which I think is a view of disease most people don't have. And you say that there's like this combination of three things that are likely to occur. Failure of the immune system to react to a real threat. It's like the immune system is PTSD. It's right, thinking right. things that are not threatening are threatening and things that are threatening it basically collapses and goes into a freeze state and doesn't actually respond to it. And then if it does react to a threat, it uses the wrong kind of defense. Or the third one, which of course, many people who have autoimmune disorders will readily acknowledge is the bane of their existence, attacking its own tissues. Exactly. So I, I thought you could talk a little bit about not just why this happens, but what we could do in terms of this new way of envisioning medicine to turn this around, because I think people with autoimmune disorders are frustrated and they want something that's actually going to work for them. Right. The immune training, again, occurs, well, there's, there's prenatal development as well in utero. The real major training occurs starting at birth. As I mentioned, half the immune system has to catch up. Decades ago, in Europe, particularly in Germany, they studied pregnant women and also children who grew up on animal farms. 
versus an urban area a couple miles down the road. This was an epidemiological study, but now we've been able to go in and you can see exactly what's happening microbiologically and immunologically. So what happens is they found, wow, children that grow up on animal farms, or if the mom was pregnant, during this period, they have less asthma, they have less allergic disease than the kids right down the road, really close. How's that happen? Well, they're getting exposed to bacteria associated with animal agriculture. <laughs> you know, that, that's the reality. It's, it's all over the place. It's part of getting out in a segment of nature that we don't do enough. And we now know that when you do that, Again, you start to see these changes in the immune cell population. You see changes in the cytokines. Inflammation gets ramped down. The immune system then starts to distinguish between a friendly bacterium and a real dangerous threat. And it's the balance is there. They've caught up. They mature. And that isn't happening in the urban cohort. It's right down the road. You can see exactly the differences. One exception is if the farm used pesticides and there was uh, human exposure to those pesticides, you lose all the benefit right there. It's all gone. That's why I tell people that live in urban areas now, get your kid to a petting farm. If your family's not completely atopic and allergic to you know, furry animals, get them exposed because you need that actually. Using uh, sanitizers and leaving in a sterile environment is the worst thing you can do for your lifelong health. That's the kind of immune training I'm talking about. And what happens is you have the majority of your immune cells are in the gut. It's like 65 to 70%. When I was teaching immunology at Cornell in the 70s, it was like, wow, it's all the thymus and the bone marrow. And in poultry and chickens, there's an <laughs> antibody producing organ, the bursa fibricious. That's uh, really important. It's like, well, actually, it's the gut. <laughs> it's all the mucosal tissue. It's where the portals of entry are. The immune system is heavily congregated. And we had a group that used to work in mucosal immunology, and they worked on parasites as well. And we thought, wow, those are the guys that are just out in left field. Nobody even really knows what they're doing. They don't know how it fits. We should have listened to those people. They were doing what turns out was more important. That's another part of immunological dogma is don't look in the wrong place for the wrong measure of immune function. It's what's going on where it meets the microbiome and where it meets the pathogens. Airways, gut, skin, your genital tract. That training's critical because that is going to determine if you have the immune cells going off in an unregulated way. And that's what happens with the current pandemic is you have cytokine storm and it can actually happen in a couple of tissues. Lung is one of them, but that's not the only place where you can have this immune problem. And most of the deaths are secondary bacterial infection and pneumonia because you've torn up your lung. You've removed some of the natural physical barriers for protecting against bacteria. And, and that's what happened in 1918 with the Spanish flu. It was over immune reaction. And those individuals that did that in their airways died of secondary pneumonia. Even there, when you have a virus promoting something, it's because your immune system didn't react properly that you got a problem. And another reason why herd immunity is a wonderful thing, because you have multiple kinds of protection against this pandemic virus, not just an antibody against a protein. I'm wondering if somebody will end up doing some kind of correlational public health studies where they start looking at the individuals who ended up in cytokine storm and, and looked at what their health picture was like prior. Which of the NCDs were they actually suffering from? If mm -hmm. you had a certain number of them or overexpression of mm -hmm. autoimmune or immune dysfunction in your system, COVID is a smart virus, so was it more likely to recognize all that dysfunction in your system and really go for it? I would think exposure uh, is likely to be pretty similar, except for some surface area things. I mean, you, you breathe it in or you don't, you have it on right. contact or you don't. I live in an area that, where the soil is copper rich, and by the way, copper kills this virus, so <laughs> we just roll around in the dirt and we're good to go, you know? <laughs> but what happens after that? So right. if you have these NCDs, your microbiome is already restricted. You're, you're one of the ones, again, that were colonization resistance probably stinks. And if you're in the elderly population, your microbiome may be restricted. And then your nutrient intake, because the microbes aren't there to metabolize food well, so you're not getting everything out of your food that you should be getting to support immune health and other physiological health. So that's a vicious cycle. Underlying inflammation is there because you've got these diseases. So that's kind of the perfect storm for the cytokine storm. I, I didn't hear any bureaucrats talking about, let's just protect against cytokine storm because if we do that, nobody's going to die. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that would be a really good idea, you know. <laughs>
If you don't mind, let me give you one restriction that was put into place and a risk factor that's really become very clear in the last two years that I haven't heard anybody talking about, mask requirements. Mm. Uh, bacteria are big, viruses are not. Masks do pretty well against bacteria, not so much against viruses. You can start with, what are we doing? It's a virus. But the other thing is, it, it is very clear that prolonged wearing of these masks, and maybe they're not changed quite as frequently. Your face doesn't get cleaned in the same way as frequently. Your face doesn't get vitamin D, sunlight exposure. So you're at greater risk for a bacterium known as Staphylococcus aureus. And by the way, that's the same as MRSA in hospitals that tends to be antibiotic resistant. Staph can grow on skin and staph can grow in the gut and in the nasal passages. So curing staph in your nasal passages, as you might do if you had staph exposure by wearing a prolonged wearing a mask on your face, is kind of a problem because it's now known that if you do that, if you carry that, your risk of asthma is dramatically increased because there are multiple ways, including staph being the allergen, staph being the immune bias trigger. Uh, staph toxins doing like three different things that contribute to asthma risk. You don't want that being carried. And the best way to not carry it is to have a robust skin, nose, microbiome and stop wearing the stinking mask. So it's really interesting. I lived in Japan for four years where, mm -hmm. frankly, it, you know, if you feel sick in any little way, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. culturally appropriate to wear a mask. Right. Now, that, of course, is different than the months and months in which right. people had been required to wear masks. So I can definitely see this. On the other hand, you know, physicians basically have been wearing masks, N95s. What they're wearing masks to protect against mainly, that would be MRSA and Clostridium, although it's now given a Clostroidides, it's got a new mm. family name, Difficile, C. diff. Those are yeah. the two major hospital-borne bacterial infections. And if you go into a hospital, you're at some significant risk for difficult to treat life-threatening bacteria. Masks are really good, and you don't want that exposure in surgery. We've had like an extreme version of mask wearing yes. to me, only because I lived in a yes, culture exactly. that didn't have an extreme version. And I could pretty much say the years I lived in Asia, you know, it's always very comforting. This is sort of emotional, I think, in the culture. Right. It's comforting when you see someone caring enough to make sure that whatever's going on for them, you're not going to get. Right. But of course, they're wearing a mask for a few days. So that is wearing it because you know you're sick. That is not wearing it prophylactically across the whole population. What's the animal equivalent of that? That would be if you really had a, a sick companion animal or a sick agricultural species yes. that you might have to treat with antibiotic, but you'd recognize what you've done. And if it were meat producing or something, you'd be very careful. As opposed to prophylactic use of antibiotics in animal feed, which would be yeah. the equivalent of wearing masks, the whole population, when the actual infected were a small, comparatively small. Actually, this is relevant for me. I'm in Santa Clara County, which frankly was the first county that got shut down in the United States mm -hmm. on March 15th. We've been under really dramatic restrictions for mm -hmm. a very long mm -hmm. time. Even when there weren't that many cases in the summer, we really were under pretty dramatic restrictions. And mm -hmm. we're in yellow now, supposedly June 15th. California, the mask restriction is going to be optional, Yay. even indoors. Yes. But we're, yes. we're a medical facility. The idea of not having everybody wear a mask in the public spaces, because we have private offices, emotionally, the idea of allowing anybody to just be in our office again, willy nilly without a mask on in a public space, it's giving us pause means that we have been uh, in a relatively short duration of time taken out of uh, what I consider normal human interactions. Pretty much everyone here is also fully vaccinated. Everybody wants to get back to work. Everybody just wants things to go back to normal because nobody lost their job here. The world has been running on Silicon Valley. So it's been insane for everyone yeah. working at home. I understand we're in a little bit different situation here in Cochise County. People they take their freedom pretty seriously around here. I'm trying to use this as a way to say that this is sort of part and parcel with the problem with the, the healthcare in general. We're kind of looking at solutions that aren't necessarily the ones that are going to carry us throughout life in a healthy way. My main hobby is swing dancing, cool. is swing dancing. And it both helps me in terms of creative processes and it keeps me physically fit. And I can't do social swing dancing. 
And that has been a bitter pill. <laughs> I have several patients who have been waiting for a year for ballroom dancing to come back yes, and salsa dancing yes. to come back. And yes, they, also, are, yes. they are coming back here. People are reluctant to go back into the things that they love that involved other people. Hopefully by the end of the summer, everybody will be used to it and things will be fine again. I'm hoping. Yeah. We, we shall see. Would you be willing to talk a little bit about the ways in which people can analyze your microbiome and do rebiosis? Mm -hmm. Part of the challenge was finding out what you have. And I think that has frustrated some physicians that do want to dive into this. Physicians get blood panel or hormone panel or whatever. Part of physical checkup sometimes is seeing where you are in terms of other, what we would call biomarkers of your physiological systems. They need to have a profile of your microbiome. And the reason they do is because it impacts dramatically drug metabolism. If they don't know what's in the microbiome, they're flying blind when they prescribe drugs. And I can mm. give you examples on where knowing the microbiome would have saved lives. Once you have an idea of where you are, we do have some ideas of where you might want to go. Diet can help a lot. Diet is a powerful driver, but diet in the absence of helping have available the bacteria you want to feed is a problem. Well, if I just keep eating this, something good's got to happen. Well, it may, but it's like me trying to get pizza-loving microbes to be okay with kale, and it would actually help if I provided some microbes that want to see kale flowing mm -hmm. through my system. That would give me a fighting chance on having some good things happen and good metabolites produced. There are ways to analyze fecal analysis, and there are other body site skin as well, where they can do body site analysis. We had a lot of variation between companies, and so I won't name sources over others for analysis. If you get one that seems to be useful, stick with it. My wife at one time got prescribed a drug that was supposed to be just fine, and it obliterated her microbiome. We could see it because she was getting tested every quarter, fecal mm. microbiota testing. You could see what it wiped out. And mm. so it took her nine months with diet and probiotics to build it back. And I have a chronic NCD, and it leads to complications of infectious diseases. I had 30 years of three to four rounds of antibiotic per year, which is not a good life course. I had different doctors, but they never picked up on, oh, you, we shouldn't be prescribing this number of antibiotics. And I was doing what the doctor said, but I found combinations of probiotics. One's a human source probiotic that will put out the inflammatory response that then leads to secondary bacterial infections. I don't have the need for the antibiotics. Hmm. So I can put out the fire in the gut that otherwise would produce chronic sinusitis. Is um, there a way for people to know who's reputable in terms of testing and who isn't? You can look at who researchers are using for companies as well, or where, how they get analyses done. That's one way. We had some good luck with one that's actually no longer in business because they did some things later on that were ethical. So okay. let me say one thing about probiotics in general. Yes, pay attention to the name of the probiotic, but pay attention to the letters and numbers after that, because that's the strain designation. That is the group of genes that those bacteria carry. Lactobacillus acidophilus, found in a lot of yogurts, is not lactobacillus acidophilus identical in other yogurts or in other, even maybe in other batches. There are cultures and there are strains that are a set of genes, and you want the set of genes that works. The technical name is metabologenomics. You want the gene groupings among your bacteria, whether it's gut, skin, airways, your genital, that produce a metabolic milieu that protects you against pathogens and supports your physiological systems, provides hmm. good metabolites for your body as well. There are some that are very useful, some that work remarkably well against things like diabetes and inflammatory bowel, and some that work in early childhood that are on the market now. But it is very useful for you to know you could spend a lot of money on probiotics without knowing where you are and where you are trying to get. And for that reason, some analysis can be very beneficial. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd go where the researchers go when that's possible. We found ones in the literature that had good results for what we were looking for, looked at reviewers' comments. Had these been used by anybody? Did real people use these? And what do they have to say about them? Like TripAdvisor. Mm -hmm. And then we test drove them in our own bodies. And you will know, you'll be able to tell if something's really beneficial. So one of the ones that had a really good literature on it did nothing for either one of us. And it could be <laughs> we didn't take the right dose or we didn't take it long enough. 
we've got one right now that my wife has had incredible changes in uh, some of her metabolic profiles uh, that mm-hmm. would be connected to prediabetes. She's had incredible weight loss. It's just a, a whole different me- metabolic shift. It isn't doing the same thing in me. And it's very expensive. She is wearing clothes she couldn't wear for 10 to 15 years. The second part is feed it. So a lot of these come with, they're called symbiotics. They come with the prebiotics. And prebiotics are yeah. some version of fiber, but there are a lot of different kinds of fiber. Get one that you can use in your own body. There's no one size fits all. And there and there's some natural food stuff. So leeks, chicory root, dandelion, greens, uh, garlic, onions, asparagus, bananas, cocoa, barley, carrying it, things like inulin that are good prebiotics. There also are supplements that where they're kind of loaded with the prebiotic and the bacterium, and sometimes more than one bacterium. But again, you kind of need to know what you're looking for. Pay attention to strain. Get the right strain where the research was done, hopefully showing human benefit. So this is real precision medicine, obviously. It is. This is what precision medicine should be. Well, let me tell you too, there are multiple healthy microbiomes. So for example, if I were doing a fecal microbiota transplant, I need to one to try to aim for a donor that is actually going to be kind of close to what my immune system of my ancestors saw back in the day. Turns out my ancestors came from Europe and Africa. So there's some extremely good, healthy Asian microbiomes, but that might not be where I want to go in probiotics or a microbiota transplant. Because again, there is actually some evidence. You can actually separate species in nature by having massively incompatible microbiomes and immune systems. That can be a species barrier. So again, we can create species or we can make them go away with antibiotics and wiping out that bad microbiome in the immune system. In a way, non-communicable diseases are a milder version of species incompatibility. (laughs) There were parasitic wasps, and then they did house Mm -hmm. mice in Europe. They were geographically separated. But the parasitic wasps, they kill the larva. The immune system says, no way I'm letting this larva survive. And it's a massive inflammatory response. Lo and behold, so that's how important inflammation is, is it can allow animals to be in the same species, or it can send you away as a different species. (laughs) Yeah, that was a huge revelation that, again, emphasizes how critical the immune microbiota interaction really is. You got to train the immune system and you got to give it something to work with. I have a point of view about depression and anxiety and mood disorders that they are, Mm -hmm. in fact, inflammatory disorders. Yes, I would absolutely agree. In addition, you can add something that people don't think about, frailty. Did you know that the muscle wasting and frailty is a pro-inflammatory condition? Even in the brain, there's a a cell type. Unfortunately, macrophages, the reason we don't appreciate them is they're given a different name in every tissue they're in. Cuffer cells in the liver, those are macrophages. Microglia in the brain, and microglia control local environment and inflammation. Those are brain macrophages. They just look different. And furthermore, what's interesting is there are more neurotransmitters made in the gut than in the brain. Yes. And there's epigenetic controls that occur among the gut microbiota. So There's a group at University College Cork, and they have a book too uh, called Psychobiotics, and they have worked with changing the balance of microbes in the gut because there's some that are serotonin producers and some dopamine producers and norepinephrine that they specialize in that. They've been able to get very good results with anxiety and with major depressive disorder just by shifting the ratio of what's already in your body. So the medicine's in your body. And of course, along with that, it doesn't work unless it's addressing some of the inflammatory imbalances in the tissues. I think that is a terrific promise and another reason to focus first on the microbiome and then worry about hardcore drugs later on. You mentioned fetal transplant, and I know that of all the mental health disorders people have been trying this in, autism seems to be a condition in which fecal transplant has started to be prescribed. Yes. uh, Actually, I'm connected through other activities with the group at Arizona State, did some of the work on the fecal transplants. And what is interesting is they knew where they wanted to go metabolically. So they were able to transplant bacteria and other microbes that would get them to the metabolic place in, in autistic kids that they wanted to be. And what they found is after two years, that there is persistence of the change in the the microbiome profile in the gut. What they seeded has held and and given a new profile of the microbiome. There is improvement in any gastrointestinal symptoms because a percentage of autistic spectrum individuals have gastrointestinal problems, and those have been improved dramatically, and there's dramatic improvement in functionality, and that's persistent as well. You can use this metabolically driven shift in gut microbiome profiles 
to reduce the healthcare needs and caregiver status and improve function with mm -hmm. autism, yes. The hardcore boundary that even I talked about it in the book, because this is a new concept. The last couple of years, people are realizing there's really not the boundary between non-communicable and communicable or infectious diseases. They are actually intertwined in a way we didn't appreciate. This makes me think of Alzheimer's because mm -hmm. Alzheimer's is quickly not not only becoming thought of as the second diabetes, but frankly, as a virally yeah. initiated disorder. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe by the herpes virus, possibly, maybe something else. But mm -hmm. I can see how having a sick microbiome would give rise to the Alzheimer's disorder quite easily because basically there's nothing getting in the way of the virus starting to attack brain cells. So it may be the virus that's the, the, the tipping point, but maybe some other things have affected the immune system so that the response you're going to get when the virus right. shows up is damaging and not what it should be to clear the virus. Right. So again, just like SARS-2 or COVID-19 and cytokine storm in the lung, we know that that doesn't happen to everybody and it doesn't happen because they don't have this underlying inflammatory problem. The brain does not have a microbiome, correct? Yeah, there's a debate about that. <laughs> Theoretically, you know, it's blood brain barrier and the like, but uh, mm. I, I'm not going to give you a yes or no one. I haven't read the definitive proof. It's pretty close to like the boundary between non communicable diseases and communicable diseases. Uh, so to say that there are absolutely no microbes in the brain is, I don't know. We'll see. We know there's a lymph pathway into the brain. Yes. So many things that we knew for sure in the 70s. I have a list. Actually, I start my lectures with dogmas that need to go away. They are holding us back in healthcare. Get rid of them now. They're no longer useful. The general public needs to understand that science does move along what they were taught in the day. You know, it was the best at the time, but completely wrong. That's why I enjoyed teaching creative problem solving at Cornell so much, because I could teach people that probably those tools are going to last for their lifetime. But the immunology I taught in the 70s, man, what I was teaching is embarrassing because it's just wrong. Well, it may have been wrong, but clearly your psyche was connected enough to have had a dream to have led you down the correct path. Well, that's the useful thing. I taught embodied cognition tools. You know, if you can unfocus. Let's go get some information in your body. You've got stuff stored in there. Where is the mind really? Well, probably a little broader than we thought. I wanted to mention one soil bacterium, if I can, Please. about the yes. neurostatus. There is a wonderful work at University of Colorado, Microbacterium vacci, V-A-C-C-A-E is the species name. And this bacterium has a remarkable capacity to reduce anxiety, to improve PTSD. Exposure through skin or on skin or inhalation, it has that effect. And they can show the metabolic changes that, that contribute to that. When you put your feet on soil and your hands in soil, you connect to one with a yes. robust microbiome. That bacterium can solve just some of your neuro issues right there. And that exposure is really important for our maintenance. And it's all the more reason why I tell people, get out in nature, do whatever you can in nature. When you're hugging a tree, probably accessing some microbes. You can see I get very excited talking about all of this. And it's made a huge difference in my own life. And I just want other people to share in some of the, the wonderful experiences I've had. Well, you can see I get very excited because for me, science is much more deeply strange than any spiritual thing <laughs> anyone could come up with. Your story about the soil is a perfect example. Psychotherapists, we're always telling our patients, you should be in nature, you should go walking in forests because it feels good. Oh, by the way, there are actually microbes in the soil that will have an impact on the kind of dysregulation and disruption yes. in your autonomic nervous system functioning. Citizen science is be the observer. We need somebody with a different perspective, taking a different look at it. And so maybe the fact that I didn't work on the microbiome my whole career, that I just had a dream, lets mm -hmm. me look at it a little bit differently, maybe. In my world, I would say everything you did up until the moment of that dream made it possible for you to have that dream. It's prep work. If I've helped in public health, if I've helped in, in human health. I would say you've not only helped, we've benefited greatly. And I can see that being a pioneer, I know it's hard when you're at the head of a wave because it takes the wave a while to catch up, but catching up is happening.
Exactly. And this is what I'll be telling the FDA in the fall. Okay, we didn't know. I mean, and I can go through the drugs. You have to realize the percentage of drugs on the market damage the microbiome because they were never screened yep. for safety. And that includes NSAIDs if you're taking them chron uh, chronically or long term. And then proton pump inhibitors, which you take to prevent gastric ulcers from NSAIDs. They both damage the microbiome. We didn't know then, but we do now. So, hey, FDA, CDC, EPA, food industries, food emulsifiers, quickest way to metabolic syndrome, I know. And they're in a lot of foods. So no excuses anymore, we know. Patients and people need to realize that the story of not being locked into regimen and dogma extends to our health status and the like. And you need to really feel empowered. Don't let a diagnosis and prior experience, prior experience does not predict future outcomes. Yeah, <laughs> you want to play that game because your outcome is going to be better than the prior experiences. And it can be better. Just don't let them lock you into what is an old 20th century protocol. I think this is a beautiful place for us to end. And I cannot thank you enough. This has truly, in four seasons of doing the Groundless Ground podcast, I think this has been the most exciting two hours I've ever had. And thank you so much, Rodney. Well, I can't thank you enough, Lisa. Thanks for listening to today's show. To get in touch, please visit groundlessground.com. Let's dedicate our efforts to the healing of our planet and all its inhabitants. See you next time on the Groundless Ground.